Hickok 45. Looks like a good day at the compound, doesn't it? Isn't that a beautiful table? <laughs> we have U.S. military firearms since eight or 1776 or thereabouts. These are firearms I own. I don't own them all. We'll talk about that. But I have a lot of them. And we're going to spend a couple of minutes letting you know about each one. So we want to get started. What we're going to do here, as you see, on this first row are mostly the, the main firearms, you know, from back in history. We're going to start with the flintlocks as it moved into a flintlock cap lock. And then the uh, percussion revolvers and how they changed and the sizes of them and the capacity. And then into cartridge firearms, the old Colt double action cartridge guns oh, ooh, and the evil semi-automatic firearm yeah we eventually got to those didn't we and then the the newer iterations of those and i've got a couple up here that that are were adopted as well but maybe they weren't the main firearm and you know all that sort of thing we'll talk a little bit about that so that's what we're going to do and we're going to have fun doing it because you know i'm having a good time with this don't you so let's just get right at it Look at this first firearm. You know, back in the 1700s, of course, everything was flintlock. Hey, it was flintlock for a couple of hundred years, right? And you imagine that your great granddaddy and your granddaddy and you and your kids, the only firearms you know about are flintlocks. <laughs> and this was a flintlock pistol. Now this happens to be an 1805 Harper's Ferry. There were some others made before that, of course, that, that the military used, okay? The US military is more of a hodgepodge. I'm not real familiar with some of those. And uh, this one, I think, was the first one made by a U.S. arsenal, Harper's Ferry. They're kind of like Springfield Armory, but Harper's Ferry made these, you know, for the military. And that's pretty cool. Also, this is the, the uh, very gun that Andrew Jackson used in his duel with, what's the guy's name, Dickinson or something? Before he was president, he killed the guy in a duel with, with this 1805 Harper's Ferry. Now, I've got it loaded, and it's at half cocked, and I don't want to go off half cocked. We're going to shoot the thing. Is that okay? So let's see if it'll work. I'll put my ears on. We're going to try to shoot almost all of these. How's that? Man, talk about a labor of love. I've got the pan charged. And let's see if we can hit that target. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hit it. I felt the hesitation, but it fired. I think I hit it. Yeah. Oh, man, those things are fun to shoot. Now, this is 1800, basically, 1805. Like I said, there were some of these before that, but this is an example of the kind of firearm that people were using at that time, you know? And uh, I did some research. I was trying to figure out what the U.S. military used, uh, like, in the 1600s, like 1605 and that kind of thing. I couldn't find anything on that. I don't know why. Well, and then there are also some after this that I don't have. I'm lucky to have this. Uh, there was a there was a North version. It was called North and Cheney, I think, made it in 1816 and 1816 model. And I think there was even another one in 26 or something. So there were another cap lock or two that was used, and uh, they weren't, I think, made by Harper's Ferry. So you know, for those people that really know this stuff and study it, there were some others. And then in 36, 1836, we're in the 1800s now, folks. Okay, keep in mind. <laughs> We had the uh, the U.S. model of 1836, the Robert Johnson. This is a Johnson and uh, Asa, Asa Waters made these as well, both of them up in Massachusetts and Connecticut. You've seen this one. We have videos on virtually every firearm on the table, just a couple that we don't. And when we do, we'll also link to that, okay, in this video, in the description of this video. So watch for the links, and it will be updated. I'll, I'll make a point to do that. And I'll put all the links to, uh, to some, at least one of the uh, videos on each of these firearms that we have videos on currently, okay? So, yeah, this is uh, uh, an interesting firearm. It's 54 caliber. I didn't tell you this is 58 caliber, okay? This is 54. It's a smoothbore. Both of them are smoothbore. And uh, this is a cap lock now. But in 36, it was a flint lock. You see how it's been converted, as I explained in the video on this firearm. So this one represents the transition between cap lock and, or excuse me, flint lock and cap lock. This one started out as cap, as flint lock. Now it's flint lock. I think around 1850, they converted a bunch of these. So you'll see them both ways. Most of them that I've seen are actually uh, cap locks. And they're actually used in the Civil War a little bit, okay, early on. So I'm gonna put a cap on it since it's a cap lock. And I have it loaded. Everything on this table almost is loaded. That's unusual. We don't do that, <laughs> generally speaking. But in the interest of time, we really had no choice, right? Okay. So, 
54 caliber. So here we are in the era of the cap lock, even though it's a single shot smoothbore. Boom! All right, now that kicked a little bit. Yeah, interesting firearm. Most of you have seen the video probably on that. If not, the rest of you will go watch for it, right? <laughs> and so single shots, yeah, that was it. That's what you had, black powder, muzzle loading, single shot. You know, you had to load them from the front, you know, put the powder in there and, and ran the ball down there and then put your rod back. I mean, that, that's how they worked. I knew I had to load them before the video, of course, the interest of time and all that. You know, and this one the same way, you got the ramrod with it. So for a long time, we were uh, flint locks and cap locks and single shot, smooth bore in the, in the world of firearms. So you see how that works, that flint comes down and hits that prism, and cock it again. So you put powder in there and you put that down, watch the spark, it should spark. Yeah, see, makes a spark with that flint, lights the powder in the pan and it goes into the chamber and ignites it. That's how it works. Pretty neat, huh? Pretty innovative for, again, a couple hundred years. That was it. And then we uh, graduated to cap lock. Uh, like I say, this one started out as a flint, and then it uh, was converted, and there we go. That was, uh, you know, around the 18, I think, 42, 1842, the military officially went to cap lock firearms, pretty much, although they were still making these things in flint at the time. <laughs> And you know how it is, it's slow to transition. And so, uh, yeah, still making flint locks and military buying them, you know. So that's just the way it always goes. Now, I got a little bit of gap here. The first revolver, at least successful revolver to some extent, was the Patterson, the Colt Patterson. Old Sam figured out how to make a rotating cylinder and a revolver and, and you know, on the commercial market and military used it some. And it, it would be here if I had one. It was a five shot, you've probably seen it. It has a drop, a folding trigger. And the first ones didn't even have a loading uh, tool on them or anything. So uh, I, I've never owned one. I don't have a lot of desire to own one of those, but uh, they're, they're an interesting revolver. They were used by the Texas Rangers and uh, you, know, you know, to some extent, and they kind of signaled the beginning of, of revolvers. But they were only like 30, what were they, 30? They weren't even 36 caliber, I think, 32, maybe. Uh, they were a, a, a small caliber and kind of unreliable and a little uh, fragile and everything. But the people that used them loved them. And so they went about trying to create a better revolver. And I think it's Sam Walker was in on that. And he helped and, and collaborated with Sam Colt. They came up with the Walker Colt. Okay, <laughs> a big old revolver. And that is one of the biggest you'll ever see. How's that for a hog leg? And that was in 1846, I think they patented it maybe, but 1847 is when this came out. And it, coincidentally, I think the year they were shipped, uh, Sam, Samuel Walker was killed in battle. Okay, I guess it was in the Mexican-American War, but he was, he was killed, not with one of these, I guess, but he was, he was killed. So he didn't really see the success of it. So let's see if it'll shoot. Now, I don't know if I got the right size cap. I've never fired this one. This is one we do not have a video on as I speak today. It's just been, uh, been around. I've been meaning to do it. I got it loaded though. So let's try it. Make sure, let's see what we'll fire. All right. <laughs> All right like it I'm, I'm gonna have hang-ups and then that, that's fine then we'll just you know these caps they get on and this is what you had to deal with with a cap lock you get caps down in there and everything and I've always had trouble with that because you're supposed to hold it up I think when you after you fired hopefully they drop out there we go we got it out I'll shoot him again <laughs> then get it to fall away from the gun if you can there we go that one didn't go off Let's hit him again. Maybe he will. Since he's almost empty, I'd like to empty him. This is a big old horse pistol. And it was called a horse pistol for a good reason. They, uh, they had two holsters and they would fit over the, the, maybe the saddle, I guess, or the, the horse. And you'd have one on the right and one on the left. And you know, I've seen those before, originals, because it's a big old heavy thing. It wasn't really designed as a belt gun, okay? So 
since this one's clear and we got shots out of all of them, let me uh, just quickly, again, for people who don't know, you uh, you got to you know, load them from the front, not from up here because it's a revolver. And it's, of course, empty. I fired it six times, right? And so the cylinder will turn. So what you do is, uh, you know, you pour your powder in there. You have a flask or whatever. And you put in, you measure it. You put it in there the right amount. And uh, then you put the ball in there. And then you press the ball in with that lever, see? bring it around and it's 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 tedious there's no doubt about it i loaded all these today and <laughs> thank goodness for cartridges that's all i can say <laughs> see how that works and uh this one it didn't have a clip and that would fall down sometimes under recoil and there was there were there were some problems with this but it was a powerful the most powerful firearm it was a, really a magnum of the day and I think you could put 60 grains of powder in that thing, so it was really powerful. 44, okay, 44 caliber. And, uh, you know, again, Sam Walker and Walker. And then uh, this is the Dragoon that kind of replaced it. Now, this is the third model Dragoon, you can tell by the rounded trigger guard. But uh, the early ones were, you know, not all that different. And it was an improvement over that. A little bit smaller, and they improved the uh, the ramrod. So before I mess with it, i got to remember now, keep my hands away from that. Uh, Let's go ahead and fire it, okay? We'll see if we can empty it. We do have a video on this. Boom. Get those <laughs> cases to fall. Whoop. <laughs> I just shook the case off. Of, I don't have another one there, I guess. Yeah, that's too big. That's a, oh well, that's all right. We'll just bypass that chamber. I'll fire it after y'all leave. <laughs> so, so we got five out of it. We got one that's got to be fired. We'll remember that. So this was, uh, now it's pretty safe because there's no fire. There's no cap on it, right? It's like having a cartridge without a primer. But this was an improved uh, loading device and it would snap closed up here. It would stay in place better. A little bit smaller, but that thing is still a chunk. It's still a chunk. You might have seen that in True Grit, the old... Uh, the old Dragoon, just, just a beautiful, beautiful piece of, of iron, even though it is big and heavy. And it was known to be pretty reliable, just large and heavy, and uh, generally worked pretty well. So there were like three or four different models of it and uh, as it progressed, okay? But you see in this time period, even though we've got revolvers that you can fire five or six times, the Patterson was five, these are six, and they're both 44, I didn't say that. Uh, they're big, heavy things. This one you could, uh, I guess you could carry one of these on your belt, but that'd be a that'd be a load, definitely be a load. And so they're constantly working to make them smaller, and uh, you know if they possibly could. And that brought on the 1860. Okay, so we're talking with the dragoons made from 1847 or eight up through about 1860. Okay, and that's when uh, this came out, and this is a a classic. This is a, a firearm that was used. It's 44 as well, used in the Civil War extensively by the North, especially, okay, because it was you know, manufactured for the North. But, you know, in the Civil War, whoever could get hold of them would use them. But see, you notice the difference. This thing feels good. It's, it's a good looking firearm. And it weighs about half of what the Dragoon does or the Walker Colt. So this could actually be carried on the belt. And it was, you know, by soldiers. Now, I've had some trouble with the wedge on this today and everything. And uh, I've got, uh, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, I forgot it. It's it's locked up on me again. I've had trouble with this thing. It, it's going in the trash, or I'm gonna sell it for parts or something. But uh, I had it loaded, and in just so much trouble, I'm not gonna fire it. But uh, it's it. This was considered a I don't one of the the most I don't know ergo ergonomic, uh, best looking percussion revolvers ever made. And it was widely distributed in the war. I think it made two or three hundred thousand of these things, and uh, just a wonderful uh, uh, pistol, no doubt about it. Uh, and its counterpart, sort of, that was also adopted and used in the in the during Civil War times, is this one, the Remington. Uh, it was a little more expensive, but it was really liked. I've never liked Remingtons as much as Colts, but some people like the feel of them better. And this firearm, the Remington, it's not doesn't have quite the looks and the lines of the Colt 1860, 
but it's actually, I think, more reliable and, and really less trouble, I think. And that was kind of the consensus on it. Because you it had a frame, you had a top strap, and the cylinder and everything was easier to take out. I can't do that now, it's loaded. So let's go ahead and fire it and uh, see if we can get six out of this one. <laughs> we might. I knew we wouldn't out of most of these. Boom. This is nice, it's late enough in the evening. We're seeing the fire. <laughs> See, that was it. So this is the one I would take to battle today. Uh, if you'd asked me that 20 years ago, I'd have said, oh, I gotta have a Colt. They feel so much better and everything. But I just always have issues with that barrel wedge and they're more uh, problematic. But this was uh, the 1858 uh, Remington. And really that's not what they called it. It was uh, just a Remington whatever Beetle or something. But it had on the patent uh, 1858 and I think it wasn't even available really in any kind of production until 1861. And, but still people got to call it the 58 Remington and you know how that is, things stick. Just like people start out mispronouncing John Guerin, uh, Guerin's name and call it Garan and it sticks. So these are, these are nice uh, pistols. You see all these in the movies and uh, this is one where you can more easily have spare cylinders loaded and, uh, and then and now that we got all six shots out of it, I can show you. Just pull that down and pull this out. It's like more like a, a newer, newer single action or something. You have cock. Pull that down, and then you can pull this out. It's I'm not going to do it now. And then the cylinder comes out, and you put another one in. So this would be one that I would want to carry, especially if I had extra cylinders for it. So and accurate, and just it actually, I, I, it's grown on me over the years. Really nice. Okay, so the Remington. 44 as well. All these are 44 caliber here. Okay, 44. Now one that, that uh, I, I don't have down here on the main line and very very uh, uh, popular and a classic is the uh, the 51 Navy Colt. You know this is what Hickok carried two of these, and it's it's percussion, but it's 36 caliber. All right, and it came about guess when? Around 1851. And let's see if it'll shoot. Uh, or do I have trouble with it too? I think the trouble I had with it when I was loading it was the, uh, I think I got the wrong size caps on it. I think they're too large. <laughs> but it's a sweet shooter. And even though it's a small caliber, supposedly about equivalent of 380 or something, you know, if you're carrying it for defense. But, you know, if you can shoot, and of course Hickok was, uh, he was, he was famous for being able to shoot well. So, uh, he was a dangerous dude with a couple of these, no doubt about it. Because, boy, it does uh, no recoil and uh, just a very, very sweet shooter. So, this was used by, uh, by soldiers on both sides during war between the states, Civil War. But, because it had been around a long time. It had been like a Glock 19 or something. It has been around so long. Um, that, uh, you know, people just had them, and they bought them, and then, uh, you know, and, and I don't know, you, uh, you know, fill in the, the gaps here. The military may have bought some, the U.S. military, for some soldiers as well, but it, it was just so common, and there were so many of those made, too, that it was used, and it was around, okay? Uh, all right, so now it's 36 caliber, so we're moving on up here. And guess what? In the late 1860s, the uh, patent ran out that Smith & Wesson controlled. That's why I had these two cylinders out here. Uh, it was a rolling white patent for bored through cylinders, as it's called. Like that cylinder is bored through, all the way through, right? Well, yeah, you're asking what's so amazing about that. Well, these percussion cylinders that are in all these guns are not bored through. They're just like this. Okay, you gotta load them from the front. You can't stick a cartridge in the back, okay? You're creating your own cartridge, basically, putting powder and ball in there, and then putting a cap on. So, Colt couldn't do anything until, uh, I think it was 1869. Yeah, 1869. And uh, when that patent ran out, and so they got pretty aggressive then, though. And they started converting even these. You'll see a lot of conversions of these, especially this and, 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 and this where it would take a cartridge. They cut the back of that cylinder off and put a loading gate on it and all that. And it even it'd sometimes take this off, it wasn't needed. 
And so for a period in the late 1860s, early 1870s, uh, it's quite common to see a lot of conversions, Mason, Richards, and different, different conversions of these old percussions, because there's so many of them out there. And I don't know what it cost, but it was cheaper than buying a new firearm. And you had a cartridge gun. A lot of them were in 44, 44 American, 44 Henry maybe, and different cartridges like that. And, uh, and then the military actually adopted, I don't have that either. It's a, well, I've got a, a, a Smith & Wesson. This is the Schofield, it's similar to this. They adopted, uh, this is a Model 3 Smith & Wesson. They, they adopted a Model 3 in 44 American in 1870. I don't know how many of them they bought and how you know, prolific uh, they were you know, in the military and used, but, and it was, uh, you know, it was this gun and a cartridge gun. So that was really prior to the Colt single action being adopted, all right? And uh, so anyway, uh, when that patent ran out, I'll put these back over here, you know, then Colt was able to just create something like that, all right? Okay, and they did. <laughs> the rest is history, as they say. So we did have the Smith & Wesson, I just want to point that out, available. But then the biggie was, of course, they were working on was the, the single action, the top strap firearm that would take cartridges. And that is the Colt Single Action Army. And that's why it's called the Army. Colt SAA is you know what you see it as, because it was an Army revolver, just like these others were. And I have it loaded with black powder, and here I am going to fire it. Am I really going to do that? Are y'all going to come and help me clean these up? What a mess I have to clean up. <laughs> All right, here we go. This one was made in 18, oh, 83. Right? I forget, I always confuse. Yeah, 83. All right. Ooh. It's got a stiff hammer. Hammer spring. <laughs> now, I shouldn't have to worry about this one firing. Click. At five, cartridges are just more reliable. Okay, so that's a, and that's actually a cavalry Colt, the long barrel. So I'll just lay it back down there. But you see the difference. You don't have to load from the front. You don't have to the plunger and all that kind of thing. You just have cartridges you put in from the back. Once that Colt was able to, you know, create a farm like this legally with uh, bore through cylinders and just that uses cartridges. Cause you know, Smith and Wesson, even back in the fifties, they had the, the rice all that, they made little 22s and 32s cartridge guns. You know, they'd been making them a long time, you know, really. But Colt had not, they couldn't, couldn't do it. All right, so the Colt single action. And then, so that's 1873, the military adopts the Colt single action in 45 Colt. All right, that firearm right there, southern half inch barrel. And as with all of these firearms, if the military adopts it and you know they're being made and lots of them, it spills over into the civilian market, doesn't it? Uh, because we just tend to do that. You know, If it's a good firearm and the companies are making a lot of them, they're making them for the military, they're probably making them also for civilians, right? And uh, this was just a, a wonderful firearm, of course. And also, you know, in the Smith & Wesson, and we had uh, Schofield, uh, who who took the Model 3 and improved it and made the latch a little more convenient for cavalry. And, you know, the military also adopted this firearm, uh, the, the actual Schofield version of it, which is just a Model 3, okay, and uh, in a different chambering. The As I said, the Model 3 and I think 44 American was the first firearm the military adopted and, and used. And then when they converted this latch a little differently, uh, it, it was in the Schofield of 1875, it was in 45 caliber, okay? The same caliber as the Colt single action, but a different cartridge. Let's fire this thing. Boom. We're hitting that old Let's fire it one-handed. Click, wearing out that old target. Okay, the thing change they made was a latch had been on the frame but they, or it had been on the barrel, but they put it on the frame so a cavalry uh, person could just grab it with one thumb, one handed, and I've demonstrated that. This is in videos, of course. Inject the rounds, and that was a big change. Again, if you're new to firearms and revolvers and all this, you see how that was. That'd be a lot easier to load, wouldn't it? Open it up, put the rounds in, close it up, and uh, versus this one, you open it up, put it on half cock, 
and you have to you know work each round out individually okay now this was considered a more durable firearm uh, simpler and maybe even more ergonomic by most people but uh, but this one was a little faster so it appealed to the cavalry and it was adopted they bought quite a few of these things but what happened why did it die off well uh, Partly a lot of firearms are out there already, you know, the numbers, the Colt and everything, but you see the difference in the cartridges. We've got a 45 Colt and we got a 45 Schofield. I think Smith & Wesson was instructed to make, make it in the same chambering as the Colt single action, the way I read it, but they didn't. They decided they wanted it to be a shorter cartridge. I think that was Smith & Wesson's choice. They just thought that was cool and they were in charge and that's what they would do yeah, maybe because they had the contract or whatever so it was shorter now the problem was the shorter cartridge would work in a colt right because that's the only difference it's just shorter but this longer one the 45 that's why some people still call the 45 colt the long colt okay that's where that comes from it would not work in the schofield all right now, in this one, it does, because this is a reproduction. It's chambered for the 45 Colt, and it makes make more sense, right? So it gets you both. But the old Schofields, they were chambered only for the short one. And so you can imagine what would happen with the military. That they'd ship them the wrong ammo or, or just 45 Colt, long Colt, and they wouldn't work, and they'd have a, a lot of people that needed ammo for their Schofields. So a few times of that happening, it's like, oh, hold the horses. We're just going to stick with Colt. So that, I think, is, is why that was the end of that, that adoption period. And it didn't last all that long. Also, Schofield's, uh, as I understand, his older brother was in charge of Army Ordnance or something, or some kind of political things. And they, you know, might, that might have been part of the reason, too, they dropped it. But anyway, the old Colt went from 73 to 92. Then look at the next innovation. We have a firearm that... Whoa, so cylinder just pops out like that and you can load it. This was a 38 long Colt. Okay, 19, no, no, 1892. Let's see if it'll shoot. Boom, yeah. And it loaded with 38 long Colt. <laughs> yeah, that was a firearm. And I know it's caught a lot of flack because of a weak cartridge. And it is by most standards, but still, uh, that was pretty cool. You know, that's not all that different from modern Smith & Wessons. You know, swing out cylinder, load it up, close it up, you know, double action. You know, you can fire that thing. And of course, there were some other firearms. You know, there's a lot of firearms that are around and some were used by certain units maybe. And that kind of thing. Just like the Schofield, there was a double action version of that. I've seen those, uh, or the Smith & Wesson. And as I go through this, uh, bear in mind, Various units, uh, there, some of you who really study this stuff, you could bring up like 10 different probably firearms that were, you know, well, actually, Hickok, you know, back in 1869, the, uh, the, some unit did carry something, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. Like right now, I've got some of these guns over here on the table. I've got a Glock 19. Why would I have a Glock 19 on the table? Uh, just to point out that, uh, like today as we speak, what's the military using? They're using that firearm on the end over there, aren't they? Just adopted it a couple years ago, and then we'll talk about it. But the Navy SEALs just went to a Glock 19, and they had been carrying a SIG 226. You know, so it changes. It changes, doesn't it? And I've got a Model 10 38 Special. Air Force used the firearm much like that for a long time. It was, I think, a Model 15. had adjustable sights, but 38 Special. You know, so various units, agencies, uh, divisions, you know, the, there's, there's no limit, right, to firearms that are used by somebody. But this was a, a mainstream adoption in 1892 up through early uh, 1900s, okay? And it had several different models and little tweaks with it and everything. And, uh, you know, not a bad gun, but it was underpowered, as we discovered in the Philippines, uh, the American-Filipino War and everything. It, it just wasn't getting the job done in terms of stopping power. And so we were looking for 45. We were bringing back the, the, even the single action uh, and the new service revolvers. I think I even got one of those commercial ones out here that I have. And then and the, the big old Colt double actions in 45 came out in 1898. And so what the military did was they grabbed this one, this new service, and uh, they, they redid the cartridge a little bit so it had a bigger rim on it. But the 1909 version, we've got a video on this, 
is uh, what they went to in 1909 for a couple of years until uh, we had the 1911 out. And then it still was used. As, you know, watch that video. I go with way too much depth. And, uh, and there was also a version of the 1911 in 45. Let's see. Yeah, actually before or during the period when they were using this revolver, it was, I think, a 1905 Colt that used a 45. It just wasn't the 1911 yet. So they brought out all those 45s and got them into action because we wanted 45s. Let's shoot this thing since it's loaded. This is the 1909. It's uh, the military version of the new service. Let's go double action. <laughs> Again, swing out cylinders. See, that's the advancement in technology. Look how far we've come from flint locks, smooth bore, single shots, a percussion oh man you see the problem i had with some of these that's the beauty uh, a lot of us think of these as being wow old school archaic and everything but uh you know to be able to unload like that and load it fairly quickly in a big bore double action and a really reliable revolver that that's pretty nice right and let's see do i have any gaps here well i think i mentioned the, the 1905 semi-automatic so during this time period though from 1900 uh, on and even before that, you know, we had some people, some guy named John Browning, was that his name? I think he was working feverishly on uh, some semi automatics and different versions, and and uh, even in big caliber, like I said, the, the 05, 1905, and, and uh, that was all progressing. And then we end up in 1911 with it uh, being pretty much perfected and adopted by the military, the model of 1911. 45 ACP, all right, and that's that's just a uh, that's the classic of all classics. If you don't know anything about these firearms I've already talked about today, you probably know a little bit about the 1911. And this is actually a 1911. Uh, this was made in 1918, but it's a model 1911. I'm throwing a lot of dates out here. I hope I haven't misspoken on any of them. If I have, I'll, I'll watch the video and look at how stupid I was, and I'll uh, correct it in the description. But, you know, we don't add it much, and so sometimes they're not perfect. So let's load and shoot this thing. This was quite a change, wasn't it? Yeah, you can shoot these things pretty fast, and uh, they're reliable. And uh, I think this was the military sidearm for a while, wasn't it? A couple years? Let's see, from uh, 1911 until... 1986 or 85 <laughs> so so this was it it was single stack it was not high capacity but it it worked and uh this was uh 1911 and then i think 1924 26 along in there they upgraded a little bit changed a couple of things on it better beaver tail short trigger uh raised mainspring housing and some of you the know, little cutouts and things like that basically the same firearm that's the reason i have this one out here it's a world war ii uh, version literally this one was used in World War II uh, Colt okay so but still 1911 same same firearm okay and now while we're using this in World War One let me not forget to mention the 1917 up here this again is another version of the old new service revolver it's uh, it's the one that we went to after we adopted a 1911 it just made sense to chamber them in the same cartridge this is what the 1911 shoots and so we modified Smith and Colt both, Smith and Weston and Colt. We modified the big old new, new service revolvers to, to a chamber those. Needed a clip, and let's shoot it. Why not? Get them all dirty, since all of you are going to come over and help me clean these, right? So, so uh, you know, that old new service revolver turned out to uh, provide quite a few different options for us. And uh, you had those half moon clips. So like I said, there's my uh, commercial version. That was made in like 1902 or something, I forget. And uh, then the, the 1909, the military version, it's marked, it's a military firearm. And then so is this. This was made in 1917. And it's, it is a 1917 model, you know, the one that takes the, uh, the, the clips and, and everything. Okay, 45 ACP. Whereas this one and that one are 45 Colt, long Colt, all right? So, don't mean to confuse you, but I'm going to throw a lot at you pretty quickly here. Uh, and like I say, uh, there's 
10 books written on every one of these firearms, you know, at least. And there's really in-depth videos and all kinds of things. Uh, hopefully you're interested in learning more about all of these, okay? So, 1911. Man, what a war horse. Why do people like this so much? Because it's still fun to shoot and it's used in competition extensively. And it was the adopted pistol from 1911 to 1985, 86. That's a long time. And then we went to the Beretta. This is a nine millimeter, okay? A lot of controversy around that. People didn't like the fact we went with Beretta. They didn't like us dropping down to a nine millimeter or anything. Now this is not an M9 specifically, but it's basically the same, same gun, okay? That the military used. Beginning in 86, I think, officially, there's always a transition period, right? Uh, like right now, there are people carrying uh, the Beretta in the military as I speak. And this thing was adopted like two years ago. It just takes a while, okay? So let's shoot this. One, two. Now these the advantages, of course, it's, a, again, a reliable firearm. It's 9 millimeters, a NATO round, and it, it holds a lot of rounds, you know, 15, 16 rounds. So... Uh, just a wonderful, reliable pistol, okay? Some controversy, but uh, you know, a lot of soldiers I've talked to actually like it. It's a little big to me for a 9mm, but that was uh, used uh, from uh, 86 to basically uh, 2017. I remember when it was adopted. Gosh, I'm an old guy, and uh, yeah, been around a good while. What's that? That's, uh, that's a good while. Uh, 20 years plus uh, about 14, yeah, so over 30 years and uh, it's still still out there in operation in the military so then of course the uh, the trials you know again a few years ago they're looking at changing pills they want a more modular uh, pistol that they could uh, adapt to different environments and different sizes and all that kind of thing they have rails and just whatever and uh, so they went to the SIG P320 and that's where we are now. You see, now I've got the only difference here with this one. I've got talon grips on it because I, I like them. It feels better to me. But that's that's supposed to be, that is a version. That's a commemorative that was shipped of the early models. And I don't know if they've changed any of the colors now or not. I heard they have. But this is the, the M17. Uh, it's called the commemorative model. And the only difference is I've got the grips on it because I actually shoot it. And it's, it's my firearm. But let's shoot it, speaking of that. Okay. And so this is the official military handgun. We have finally gotten gotten uh, to the contemporary firearm being used. All right. And it's a good shooter. And it's not a bad looking pistol either. And it feels pretty good. Again, some controversy. You know, I think it came down to Sig and Glock. And Glock had a nice entry as well. And, uh, you know, these, these, all these, adopt I'm sure with every military adoption, there were other gun companies that, that wanted it and were vying for it. It felt like uh, politics and all that sort of thing won out, you know, so that, that's just kind of par for the course, isn't it? But this is where we are now. The military is using the 9mm steel in this firearm. There's a compact version of it that I think the Marines use, the Air Force, and I'm not sure. So there's an M17, this one, and an M18, the compact. And so they've got, you know, their option. They can, they can carry that, right? So, so 2017, 2019, where we are now, uh, that is the current gun. So we back through the ages again, a reminder of the progression, okay? <laughs> it, we, we covered a lot of years there pretty quickly, right? Pretty quickly, beginning with a flintlock and going up to a semi-automatic 9 millimeter. And I don't think I have left out anything too important, as if anything I say would ever be important. But uh, like I say, this is just an overview, a quick overview. If I said anything incorrect, sorry about that. But on the fly, I think I got most of it right. And just a little bit about each one. Because a lot of you, I know, uh, have you're, 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 you're vague in some of these areas, like I am. And like I say, there's lots of other firearms that were used, but pretty much covers most of the, the major firearms that have been adopted and carried by a lot of our, our service people, okay? From the early days, 1700s, 1800, right on up to today. As we speak, some of you watching this are carrying 
that SIG P320 right now, that M17. So, great guns, military guns tend to be made well because, you know, they're tested and tested and tested, and that's why we civilians end up enjoying them as well, right? So, uh, I don't have a lot else to tell you. We appreciate you checking in and uh, staying with us for, we probably took at least eight or ten minutes on this, this uh, endeavor. So, we appreciate you hanging with us and uh, appreciate you supporting the people that support us. The only thing that makes me mad is the fact that most of you are not going to come over and help me clean these things. Look at all that black powder mess. Yeah, what a lot of mess. And it's not easy to clean either, especially on these percussion revolvers. Oh, man. But anyway, we appreciate you tuning in, and uh, we might shoot these some more after you go away. Because I like to shoot, if you haven't noticed. Life is good. Oh yeah, that's better. This is a great gun for defense. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Uh, while I've got you here, I want to remind you of our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballistol. Talon Grips makes uh, grips, can you believe it? Uh, for all different types of firearms. You can get rough texture or more of a rubberized texture. Uh, it just sticks right on there. You know, really affordable, really cool option to Im improve the grip for your handguns um, or, or rifles. Uh, so please check them out at TalonGunGrips.com. You'll be glad you did. And also Ballistol. Uh, Dad has been using Ballistol for many years. It's a cleaner and a lubricant, and it's non-toxic. Uh, it works really great, and we're happy to have them on board since it's been a part of our shooting endeavor for a very long time. So go to Ballistol.com, TalonGunGrips.com. And also, while you're out there, I'm juggling all these things here. Also, uh, while you're on the internet, please do check out our other social media like Hickok45 on Facebook. There's also Hickok45 on Twitter, the real Hickok45 on Instagram. There's a John underscore Hickok45 on Instagram where I do some things. There's Hickok45.com. Uh, you can find us also on GunStreamer. So check out all that stuff and then watch more videos.